I ended my introductory lecture with Emperor Constantine's conversion to Christianity, but I also warned that we needed to backtrack to the period before Christianity received first imperial protection and then imperial adoption as the official religion. Most of the very early Christian art that we have comes from the catacombs, or tunnels and rooms carved into the limestone tufa beneath the city and used as burial chambers. These are very cool to explore and really give you a sense of the secretive, embattled status of the early Christian church. The picture on the right gives you some sense of how the catacombs look today, although electric lighting does take something away from the experience. This is not our required work, the Catacombs of Priscilla, but it's quite similar, and I've kept this slide because it contains so many useful vocabulary words, and so that I wouldn't have to rework all these circles and arrows. Polygonal frame is a term used in contemporary graphic design, and it means just what it sounds like, a geometric shape drawn around a painting or design, in this case an oval that contains a spoked wheel pattern of paintings. An orant is a figure with both arms raised in prayer. A lunette refers to a semicircular space, often above a door or a window, and often decorated with fresco painting or mosaics. I'm going to say relatively little about this required work since it was so well covered in the Khan Academy video, including why I labeled this a so-called Greek temple. Let me repeat a point I have made before, but that's especially important for this unit. You are going to be looking at a few works, specifically a few famous churches, in depth, and we're going to rely heavily on the homework to cover other works. If you skip the homework and the College Board decides to focus on one of these images, you could find yourself seriously messed up. Note that what looks like architectural features along the walls are actually just a painted surface. And where have we seen this before? This is first style Roman painting, and we saw it in Pompeii. So what is this painting showing? The conventional wisdom is that this painting is a dead woman in three stages of life, getting married on the left, raising children, nursing children on the right, and praying. That's the pose in the center. Note the modeling of her face. This is more three-dimensional than much of the Byzantine painting we'll be seeing soon. The Roman painting tradition, as exemplified by the famous portrait from Pompeii on the left, is still alive and well at this point. In the pendentives, those are the somewhat triangular corners below the shallow dome, and in the shallow dome itself we see doves. They were a symbol of peace and the Holy Spirit. Peacocks are a symbol of eternal life. And quails both walk on the earth and fly, symbolizing the strong relationship between earth and heaven in Christian faith. The College Board has never really explained why it shows this work, which is not as well known as many other catacombs or as well documented. But one theory popped up on the AP Teacher Discussion Board. It might be a reason why this work showed up on the list, so I thought I should share it. It turns out that these particular catacombs have become the center of a controversy over whether they might demonstrate that women played a different role in the early church than was generally believed or than the Catholic Church teaches. So here's another non-required painting from the catacombs of Priscilla. The figure on the left, shown breaking bread, has been identified by dress and hair as a female. Could this possibly mean that women were serving communion? Of course, we don't know that this is even a painting of communion. It could be a depiction of a funeral banquet. This image has also led some people to suggest that the central praying woman or orant is actually a priest. Since the other paintings in the set show her as a bride and as a mother, this strikes me as a little far-fetched. Vatican archaeologists have responded that the painting, like many in the catacombs, shows a deceased person praying as she enters paradise. The hands raised in prayer are common features of catacomb art. Still, it's not hard to see how the orant might be thought to resemble a priest. At any rate, I want you to be aware of this debate just in case. If you'd like to know more, I've posted a BBC article about this controversy in the enrichment page for Unit 6 on Canvas. And yes, I find the required work frustratingly blurry, too. But you should be able to see that Christ is portrayed as the Good Shepherd, one of the most common themes in early Christian art. The early images of Christ also mostly show him as a beardless young man, and they also often show him teaching his disciples, much as Socrates and other classical era teachers discussed philosophy in the Agora or Forum. 
I tried and failed to find close-up photos from our required fresco, but the Old Testament scenes apparently include Adam and Eve. Remember, Christ is the new Adam, but free from sin. Jonah sitting under a plant cursing Nineveh. Jonah, too, was buried for three days and in a sense resurrected. Moses striking the rock to get living water for his people. And finally, Abraham preparing to sacrifice Isaac as Jesus sacrificed himself for humankind. These are all Old Testament stories that show up very frequently in Christian art. Here's a famous Good Shepherd mosaic from the Western Roman capital of Ravenna. It used to be an AP favorite. And now, gang, fasten your seatbelts. We are entering the period of this course where you will start to collect a portfolio of churches and download a whole load of architectural terminology into your mental hard drives. Let's get started by reviewing the basic Roman Basilica, which was the basis for many of the imposing churches built in the reign of Constantine and his immediate successors. You've seen the slide before. What is it? This is a reconstruction of the Basilica Ulpia from Trajan's Forum, which is not a church, of course, but a public administration building. So why did the now imperial approved Christian church adopt a Roman administrative basilica plan? Well, they needed a space that would hold a lot of people. They also wanted to convey the imperial approval for this new religion. Using a famous imperial style helped send that message. And finally, they needed a longitudinal plan leading to an altar. The basilica's long nave and apse served well. The Khan Academy video about Santa Sabina mentioned Old St. Peter's. Here's a floor plan of that long since demolished church with some helpful labels. Note one very important departure from the basilica. Worshippers entered through the, the narthex on the short end of the rectangle. This led their eyes immediately toward the altar, the point of worship. Another innovation was a transept, or hall perpendicular to the main hall or nave. As we'll see in a minute, your required Basilican church, Santa Sabina, did not have a transept, but transepts would have become common elements of Christian churches, not least because they transformed a basic rectangular building into a building shaped appropriately like a cross. This is a required work, and I hope and trust you watched the excellent Khan Academy video on this church, because I'm going to go fast. Quick review. What kind of columns do you see? They're Corinthian. Note the acanthus leaves. These were taken from older Roman buildings. The term for that architectural recycling is spolia. And where have we seen spolia before? Remember the Greek, excuse me, the Roman columns in the Mosque of Cordoba. So what basilican features do you see? There's a high, flat roof, side aisles with a lower roof. You can see them sticking out in the photo of the exterior, and a rounded apse at one end. Early Basilican churches also tended to have timber roofs. So here is Santa Sabina's floor plan, another required image. In 330, Constantine moved the capital of the Roman Empire east of the town of Byzantium. He wanted a fresh start for his now Christian empire, and Rome, of course, was filled with monuments to pagan gods. But the move also reflected geopolitical realities. The Western Roman Empire was increasingly under siege from Germanic tribes. The east was also richer than the west, and therefore more important to defend. And let's face it, Constantine did not suffer from a deflated ego. He liked having his own namesake capital. Constantine died seven years later in 337. The next really important emperor is Theodosius, who ruled from 378 to 395 and declared Christianity the empire's only legal religion. He destroyed many pagan temples and holy sites and images, and he even disbanded the Olympic Games. Theodosius divided his empire between his sons, one of whom moved the capital of the Western Roman Empire to Ravenna. Since Ravenna was surrounded on all sides, either by the sea or by swamps, it was easier to defend from the many Germanic invaders, and it was closer to the eastern capital of Constantinople and more easily reached by sea. We're going to come back to Ravenna in a moment, but first let's move into some Byzantine history. All Byzantine emperors ruled as head of both the government and the church. The struggles between popes and kings that would define much of Western European medieval history had no real parallel in the Byzantine Empire. Patriarchs were important personages, uh, as were bishops, but when emperors said jump, the church leaders pretty much asked, how high? 
The two great Byzantine churches we will look at, one today, one tomorrow, were both commissioned by Justinian. He and his empress Theodora, shown here in the required mosaics from San Vitale in Ravenna, were a piece of work. Let's watch two clips from a video about the Byzantine Empire. The first gives you some background on these two rulers. The second video clip starts off just after a major riot against Justinian's rule, mostly sparked by the very high taxes he imposed to pay for his military adventures and his ambitious building program. Justinian, by the way, wanted to cut and run. Theodora, a former circus performer, prostitute, and all-around tough broad, as we'll see, had other ideas. The video leaves off with an introduction to Hagia Sophia. We will spend almost all the next class on this incredibly important church, which we've already encountered in our Islamic art unit as the inspiration and goad to what famous architect? Sinan. We're going to end this class by looking at Justinian's second most famous church, San Vitale in Ravenna. I did not assign this Khan Academy video because I wanted you to watch it and discuss it in class. Take notes in your workbook. Remember, this work has long been a college.